Hi man, Drops Wrong, and welcome to the back office Teardown Lab. I thought I'd have a little bit of a ramble today and just show you some of the things I've been working on because I'm quite aware we haven't done a tech project for a while. But it doesn't mean I'm not doing them, it's just I'm not recording them, unfortunately. So, first things first, uh, I want to show you these because I bought a whole bunch of stuff from Temu and I'm really into Temu right now. Uh, have a look at this and see if you can guess what it is. Three, two, one, I'll tell you. It is actually for clipping on broken zip pulls. You know the zipper on your jacket if it breaks off? If it breaks off in the right way, clip that in and you've got a new pull. I quite like that. Um, and I really like it because I think my motorbike boots have lost one of those. I do feel though that it has other uses because they do look kind of useful. And they came in a packet of five for like a pound. So can't go wrong there. Now, you can see I've got an array of items here, but <laughs> nothing too uh, complicated. Let's start with the basic one. So uh, on the PT Cruiser, which is a car, if you're not aware, it has a sensor boot door. Um, so what happens is, or trunk, if you're in the US, what happens is you put your fingers in there and it detects your fingers. And I'm not sure if it's capacitive or it uses light and it unlocks the boot, which is great. But it's great until it goes wrong. So one little project that you can do quite easily is you can pop the back panel, which I'm intending to do, and then using one of these little itty bitty momentary switches that you see for projects. I mean, these have existed for ages, like decades and decades. However, this is the first time I've had one which has a cap other than red, so it's just kind of cute. You can drill a little hole basically where that plastic cover is that covers whatever sensing technology it is and just wire in the switch. And it is, uh, if one of the switch is upside down and it's kind of behind a cover so it shouldn't get really very wet. And if it dies, what does it matter? It's basically a pound anyway and you can just swap it out. It's just literally a 20 minute job tops. I mean, I don't know how hard it is to get the card, the inlay card out of the back of the um, boot, but it's not going to be too bad. And of course, uh, yes, I've taken to wearing reading glasses of one diopter. Look at that. Yes, I'm getting old and uh, I do find these actually do help uh, worryingly. So <laughs> now that I'm doing my soldering work, I pop these on again, available on Amazon for like three for a fiver or something like that. Now, on to this. So recently I was in a motorhome in a hot country and that has a fridge, which is one of those like Dometic, um, I think they're called an evaporation fridge. And how they work is they're filled with a particular gas or chemical or alcohol or something like that that goes through the usual state change, like a regular fridge in your house to provide the cooling, but it doesn't have a pump in the same way. It doesn't run a pump because that's too expensive for uh, a fridge like that um, in terms of energy use. And they can run off gas, 12 volts or mains and they run I believe by just heating they've got a heater basically which acts creates that pressure and pump in the system now the problem is in a hot country um, the, there is not enough airflow through the vents they just rely on uh, airflow through the vents and it's kind of a chimney um, to, to keep those cool and, and thus keep that heat exchanger working probably draw it to you on the back of this scrap piece of paper but you can imagine this oh come on Come on, get, get a pencil. You can't go wrong with a pencil. If you imagine that is your refrigerator that's sitting inside your vehicle. On the back here, you've got your heat exchanger. And then on the side of the vehicle, I'll just that's the side of your vehicle, you actually tend to have a little vent at the top and a vent at the bottom, just like that. And then the idea is you're going to get some sort of convection happening. But then if you're having huge amounts of sun hitting this, which we measured at at least 45 degrees C and no wind, your fridge starts warming up to the point where it doesn't really act as a fridge anymore. It's like a really crap cool box. So what I did um, is I got some fans and I made a test piece like that and just to show you it's all assembled now. Uh, I had to bond them together because these are too big to print in the 3D printer bed, but they glue together quite nicely. And you can see it's basically two PC fans. And I'm going to actually rejig this because the airflow is actually this way, which is cool, but I actually want the frame on this side. And apparently fans have two different size holes, which I never knew that. So when I tried to mount it the other way around, the actual fan screws I had didn't work. So I, I don't really know what the diam why they've got two different diameters. I can only assume that that's to stop people fitting them in the case the wrong way around. So they can go wrong way. 
And what I will do with these is wire it up to this here, which is a thermostat, but based on a capillary. So this bolts to those fins on the back like that. And then there's a particular point in the pipe work on here that gets quite hot. And the harder the fridge is working, the hotter it gets. And where, where that is, I'm going to use a Jubilee clip and mount this capillary tube on there, and then just adjust it up. Once I feel that, oh, this is a hot day, I really feel the fan should come on, I'm just gonna click that till it comes on. And then that should blow that uh, heat exchanger down and hopefully cool it down. And this will turn off then when it, it's reached that temperature. Now the power for this though will come from the back of the fridge so that this, will, this assembly will only activate when the fridge is actually on anyway. And of course, if you don't have any electricity and you're on gas only, it's not gonna run. Okay, the, the, you know, you gotta, them's the limits. But gen generally, you will have 12 volts. Um, and by the way, <laughs> on these sorts of vehicles, 12 volts means 12 volts from the engine, not 12 volts from your leisure battery. So when you're using gas, yeah, the fridge will not try to use the 12 volts from the leisure battery. So I suppose technically you could wire this into the leisure battery and then that would give you this fan ability all the time. So I'm just going to start cutting up and see if we can actually just do a little quick test on the bench. First things first, as a sanity check, I've got a meter in continuity mode and I've put it on two of the three terminals. And we should hear a click. There we go, and that's them coming on. Now if I move this to here, so between one and the common rather than two and the common, it clicks the other way. So you actually have a set of normally open contacts and a set of normally closed contacts. And you will want them the right way around to make sure you're switching at the appropriate um, way. So we just need to figure out a nice circuit that we're going to use. And of course, we're just going to wire these fans in parallel. Some systems, by the way, um, allow you to have uh, an additional switch. So you can have like a low power mode and then a two dual power mode. But I think that would involve having a digital thermostat to really give that. You don't want to keep adding these into the system. I have myself a bit of wire here. So I'm just pulling the uh, insulation off the ends or stripping them, as is the more normal way to describe this activity. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tin these and I'm going to solder them. Uh, I wouldn't normally advise this, but I have run out of Lucar connectors um, or terminals. There is a, a bit of a, a query when it comes to automotive stuff that you shouldn't solder them because you'll make it brittle. And I guess that's true. So if you're using all the regular kind of terminals and things, don't do this, but I'm kind of happy enough to do it. I don't think they're going to be under particular amount of stress because once these things are all fitted, they'll be taped using cloth tape. There won't be that sort of vibration here, but in, even if it fails, it's not really a critical system and it's something that I can easily fix. But yeah, avoid it because you can work hard on it. Now, those are tinned. I've already cut the connector off, the JST connector, and fitted a terminal block. So we will go from one wire from here to our switch. These are pretty old school now, because so many clone Wagos, <laughs> the old screw terminals, don't really get a look in much these days, but I can't, can't really be bothered to go find my Wago box. And these are fine, someone's got to use them. And then I'm going to connect this supposedly live wire here and then I'm going to solder our ground wire here to this terminal here which is marked with a C which is the common. I almost thought it was marked with a G which is for ground. That would have been good. So let's see if it'll take solder. Yes it will. Of course it will. It's fine. I'm just going to solder that there. It would be quite good in the design, if I was 3D printing this again, which I may well do, is include something to hold a set of terminals. So you can have all of the strain relief and all of these connections at a terminal. So if you imagine an additional uh, one of these here, so you've got three, you'd be able to, to do that. So just going to pop this on there. Look at that. Old school pop that off. I do notice in the instructions from the Far East that uh, I see a lot of references to welding rather than solving. Um, go, what's the difference between the two? Well, welding actually fuses the metal together, whereas soldering 
is you're basically applying a, like a glue. It's like a metallized glue. Right, so I'm going to pop this in there. It should be center positive. This is my bench power supply. So I'll hold that in a second. Let's turn the old bench power supply on and pop it on. Hey! It worked! Oh, it's sucking the paper. Oh, nice. Oh, there's serious airflow from this. This might be too much airflow. It's at 414 milliamps at 13 volts. That is some serious blow. Ah! Yeah. I can see why they have switches in them to switch between one or two because that is going to work super well. I almost think I'm going to get rid of this bit of paper now because it keeps getting sucked in. <laughs> Hence, you know why the frame should be on the other side. Um, I wonder if I can get it to turn itself on and off by putting this in its airflow. I've got a cheat. Oh, there's way there's way too much hysteresis in this for this to for it to do that. It'll do it if it's a digital one, but even then you'd have digital hysteresis. And hysteresis means that there it will go either side of the set temperature for a fair bit, so that the thing isn't switching on and off like constantly. So the switch isn't going on off, on off, on off. It'll have to, set, for example, if you set it to 20 degrees, it might take up to 23 degrees before it turns on. And then it might take down to say 17 degrees before it turns off. So it's, it's always floating around that uh, median set point. Either way, I think that is going to work a treat, really. Um, the only thing I might do is add an inline switch, though, just to make sure I can turn it off on those winter days when really it's not worth having. Because that is quite a lot of noise. I think you'd possibly hear that trying to sleep. Um, the other option, of course, is a speed controller as well, and that would be quite nice. You can dial these down a bit. But there you go. That's my project for the weekend. See you in the Discord. <laughs>